Our world has changed so much since I was a kid that things that I want to do now weren't even possible for me to imagine. I don't even know if I knew it was called computer science or programming. It all sort of happened by accident. I was always excited about technology in some way and people. I thought that was just really neat to be able to control the technology instead of just having it control you. I think a lot of people wake up and they have an amazing idea when you know how to code you can go and actually make that a reality. I am the Deputy Innovation Officer. I'm a design lead, a UI designer, support engineer, software engineer, developer programs engineer, chief product and design officer. I'm a VP. I'm the CEO and founder, co-founder. I am a coder. By learning uh, about engineering, computer science, and other technical fields, you can solve the really big problems. We're trying to do things that could radically improve the world. Things like transportation and health, making our cities better places to live, and making people more connected. A place for city kids to build and create. I created a moon TV system to project video on the moon. Computer vision technology. Open source hardware company. Measure air pollution with your mobile phone. I love helping people do the things that they love to do more easily. I really, really, really enjoy the fact that I get energy from so many people. I just hope that I can see the world change in my lifetime. That inspires me. So build it around something that you like. Find something that interests you. What are you passionate about? Know what's the thing that's going to keep you going. And you can really, really have an impact on the world. Hi, everyone. Welcome. I am Pavni Divanji. I'm a VP of Engineering at Google. And I was so stoked uh, when Natalie asked me to introduce this session. Uh, I've been, from very early age, very fascinated with robots. A um, lot of my childhood conversations were dominated by R2-D2 and C-3PO at home and at school. There were two factions at school in the geek crowd, you know. There was the R2-D2 faction and then there was the C-3PO faction and we spent endless hour debating virtues and vices of the both, those beloved robots. So, and um, I have to say nothing really has changed. Uh, a few months ago, I was sitting at my Sunday breakfast uh, family um, uh, place and uh, my daughter, we were eating pancakes and my daughter blurted out very suddenly that she wished uh, Siri was more like Jarvis. Now, <laughs> I, I kind of know that she's an Iron Man, Tony Stark fanatic, but uh, it still kind of took me by surprise. Normally our conversations are not that interesting. It's normally about school and Minecraft and Pokemon and, and the robots show up in the conversation. I'm like, okay, okay, take a deep breath. And I'm like, tell me more. And so, and then, but before she could answer, my younger daughter, Maya, who's eight, was not going to be left out of the conversation. And she jumped in and she says, well, it's obvious why she likes Jarvis more. I'm like, why? Yeah, well, Siri just doesn't get kids. I'm like, oh, is that the reason? So I'm like mentally getting prepared to explain to them why it's so, such a hard problem to recognize dif different types of voices and so, stuff. But before I get a chance to actually get into the conversation, um, there's a sibling rivalry going on and Ishanyu, who is t a teenager, gets back into the conversations. Like, that's not it at all. You know, I, I really like Jarvis because it has a real personality and an attitude. So I'm like, okay, <laughs> now we are talking about robots with a personality and an attitude, okay? So um, anyway, when this conversation ended was my eight-year-old is like telling me, like, I want to build a robot. And mommy, I think I can build a better robot than Jarvis. And uh, <laughs> like parents do, I'm like letting it pass. And um, next day, she's like relentless, right? A um, few days following. So I'm like scratching my head what to do. And so finally, I ended up getting her a Lego Mindstorm kit. And here she is. She built a little rover robot a few months ago. And uh, the reason I tell this story is um, uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a silly family story, but I like to tell it because I find uh, uh, fascinating that robots never cease to be an interesting topic, no matter how old you get. Um, and I remember uh, at a very early age going through thought exercises on how to build C3PO. And um, 
Yeah, I was in that faction. But, um, <laughs> but uh, and it was kind of hard. You have to imagine a time where I was in India. There is not that many resources available. TV had just arrived. No internet, no cloud, no Google, right? It's kind of hard to imagine bringing C3PO to life. But now, the landscape has changed, right? We have fast networks. We have maps. We know, we understand the terrain really well. We have the cloud. We have Google, right? Robots don't have to do it all alone. If they have the cloud helpline, as I like to call it, oh, I don't know, know how to recognize this object. Let's dial the helpline, right? Um, I don't know how to, I, I don't quite understand the language they can, uh, also um, uh, ask the cloud. So the la it, it, indeed, it's like a really different, um, uh, exciting time. And a lot has changed. Um, and uh, I feel like uh, robots are amongst us already. It's hard to imagine a future without them. Uh, whether it's like cuddly toys we're talking about, or robots helping us in emergencies, or robots like um, uh, helping us with the car assembly line, or driving, driving cars for us, or navigating on Mars. You know, they are here to stay, and they are here next to us, helping us uh, uh, for the future. So today, I am super excited, because you're going to hear from three awesome Googlers who have built robots to assist a person in need, assist a community, and assist humanity at large. And I would like to invite Yoki, who's our Vice President of Technology at NAST, to kick off this very exciting session. Th Welcome. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm so happy to be here today um, at NEST, for those of you who know NEST, um, and as well as those of you who are getting introduced today, um, we build, or we actually reinvent unloved products in your house, such as thermostats um, and smoke detector. And we actually today launched a developers program. Yay! <laughs> Plug. Unplugged. So, um, and then um, what we, um, and one of the things actually we do is that we build beautiful products that used to be unloved, now people start to love. And not only beautiful to look at, but also beautiful to interact with. And the kind of things that we do is to really understand how humans learn to interact with certain devices and then have machine learning to interact together. And this synergy is where we can make the experience beautiful. So that's what we're going to talk about except that this is where I'm going to stop talking about Nest, and I'm going to actually tell you a little bit about robotics and a little bit of a history of how I got to Nest. And really, I'm going to talk about enabling human experience. And again, this machine learning and human experience combination, really what I like to do is to enable who you want to be. So just take a thermostat as an example. How many people actually like to save energy? Almost everybody. OK, that's great. So how many people who are staying at the hotel and remember to turn off your air conditioner or heating right before you left the room today? Not enough. And that's pretty common. But don't worry. What we can do with the technology through understanding who you are, you want to save energy, but you sometimes forget because you're human. Well, we can augment for that together. See, this is kind of the synergist thing that I'm talking about. So. You want to be an energy saver? Great. We'll enable it. Well, I actually wanted to be a tennis player. So a technology that could enable me to be a tennis player would be great. But as I grew up playing tennis and then I was competing at international level, um, I started to get injured all the time in college and have come to realize that maybe I'm not going to be the number one player in the world. So at that point, I had to reinvent, my, reinvent myself and said, well, what am I going to do next? Well, I know tennis. How about if I built a little tennis buddy for myself? It's made of robots, has legs and arms, and, and, and has buttons on the tummy. And then if you push a certain button, it might make that ten, the robot to be really, really amazing and then a great person, a great, I mean, great robot to play with, or another button that you can press which would make it a little bit weak on the day that I'm feeling a little down and I want to beat something up. So that's the kind of things that I was imagining. Wouldn't that be great if I could build something like this? So throughout college, I started to do much more of an engineering, and I got involved, and I even went to grad school 
to build a humanoid robot that looks like this. This is called COG. And I joined a team to build arms and hands and to really try to approach the human level cognition to intelligence to movement that we can mimic like humans. Well, but a couple of years later, I realized that it's really hard to do that with, the, at that time, the technology of artificial intelligence and machine learning. And I felt the reason is because we just don't understand the human brain and how it works well enough. So I jumped across, I studied neuroscience so that I, one day I was still hoping that I can build a tennis player that could play tennis with me. But throughout this whole sort of journey of migrating to neuroscience, what I've come to learn is that there are a lot of people who have neurological disorders. Who could get help by all the knowledge that I've already had in machine learning, AI, and robotics? So that's when I started to think maybe, just maybe, what I like to do is to really help other people somehow sort of reach out to those people using some things that I already know and trying to see if I can help them become who they want to be. So that's pretty much what I did. I was a professor for over a decade, really trying to invent this field called neurobotics, or you might know as a brain-computer interface, brain-machine interface. It's really about taking some of the brain signals and then extracting it, and technologically speaking, and then enhance it, and then put it back on either a limb that's paralyzed or a prosthetic limb that, uh, that for those people who lost their limbs. So this is a tool. Uh, as well as a prosthetic, future prosthetic limb that I built, spending a long time trying to understand how humans make such an amazing motion in their hand, we use in their hand. This is so simple for us, yet for a robot to just even do this. This is almost completely impossible even today. So why is that? Is this in a mechanical secret, or is this something that our brain is sending? So really dove into the scientific deep end of trying to understand how we can enable those people who lost their movement. And through that research, actually something, lots of nuggets have been found. And some of the nuggets have gone into actual prosthetic device that thousands of people wear now. This is called Touch Bionics Eye Limb. Um, and so those are really exciting little nuggets, but primarily I was really thinking about people about 30 years down the line. But it didn't just have to be about wearable devices. It could, have, it could be something that just sits on the, on the ground. Um, this is a robot um, and that sits on the ground. And then somebody, this, uh, this is a student from Harvard, but pretending to be a stroke, uh, somebody who had a stroke, and sitting and then interacting with the robotic device safely. As he's interacting with it, now the robot is gathering information about the person. The person wants to recover the person who had an injury and maybe have half the body paralyzed, can actually try to start to exercise. And then the robot side can understand, was this person tired? Is this person learning right now? Is this person able to get pushed a little further? And can have this synergistic activity between human learning and then machine learning so that we can get just the right amount of exercise and rehabilitation to make them better. And we even tried to miniaturize it. This is somebody who's playing a virtual goggle video game as she is getting her movements exercised in a way that she was not possible before. So all of this was great. And I was a professor, and then I loved teaching. But I was getting a lot of emails on the side from people, people today who were injured and really needed some help. And they read about my research and said, well, is there anything that you can do? And eventually, I sort of, it tickled me enough to the point that I thought, you know what? It's great to push the boundary of science, but at the same time, I would love to be able to do something for people today. So I built a foundation on the side. It's called Yoki Works. It's really about making something, technology, especially the intersection of machine learning and human learning, to enable you to become who you want to be. So we did things anywhere from you know, some, a kid who wanted to become a faster swimmer but um, had an amputation. Is there something that we can build? That's, and then another project that I'm going to highlight today, just as an example, is called Project Maria. And Maria was a seven-year-old girl who, actually, who came when um, Kiyoki works and said, um, actually, Maria's parents came to us and said, is there anything that Maria can do? She has cerebral palsy. She basically had stroke when she was about seven months old. She lost almost all the movements from her body. She was wheelchair bound, and there was absolutely nothing on her body that really could move with her wish. 
Um, and we got together, and then we watched her, how she moved, and then if there's anything we can bring out from her. As we watched, what she had was this on the wheelchair. This is called the communication board. And all she could do was to move just in a general direction of maybe four corners. But she had no motion that could allow her to stop at any of the squares. So all she could do was to say, yes, I'm in pain. I have to go to the bathroom. That's about it. But her parents said, and I felt the same as we were watching her, that she has something inside. She's a very, very smart person inside. And we wanted to enable this. So as parents and I were talking and the therapist was there, Maria got bored. I mean, any seven-year-old would get bored of parents talking about something that's pretty serious. So she asked in sort of her way, and then the parents noticed that she should probably look at the iPhone pictures. So her, her dad gave in the phone, and as I watched in the background, she was swiping like this. I was like, wait a second. So she, if she was motivated enough to want to look at something, she can actually make those swiping motion even though she's unable to stop at a specific location. So we said, aha, why don't we take advantage of the fact that she can make those motions and maybe allow us to, so we should build a technology that can adapt to her motion over time and then maybe just understand how much she can be pushed to learn and then we'll build a technology around it. So we went to, um, uh, nonprofit has no money, so we went to Toys R Us and we, we had um, uh, found an electronic drum machine. And we said, oh, this looks really good. They have like areas that she can go to. But wait, this is pushing motion still. She can't make pushing precisely. So we also bought rubber balls, cut it in half, and then we put them instead of those little, uh, the surface, she, the, the piece. Now, she, as she moved to swipe like the iPhone into different directions, she was able to knock down on different corners. And now, this is actually beautiful Maria. Just she's learning how to use this device. As you can see, the drum set with the rubber ball attached to it. Um, of course, we were sh shooting then, and she was a little shy in front of the camera. But you will see her sort of general swiping motion, the kind of things that she can do. So she's able to actually be told which one she should go for and then trying to target toward those motion, the directions. So what I loved about this idea was not only that we were replacing those communication in a much more precise way, she just had to knock one of those over with the motion she already has, but now we started to say, you know what? If she can get good at those four corners, she can actually start to build a vocabulary around it. What if left uh, top and the bottom right was letter A. What if the, some other combination was letter B and so forth, and if we learned it together, she could actually learn to spell, she could learn to form essays, she could take SAT, she could go to college, and she could get her own job, and she could live on her own. And that just was so exciting to be able to do. So, this is the kind of way that we wanted to mix the machine learning from the side of really understanding her capabilities and trying to adapt, even build devices to accommodate and then to make her give the human experience. <laughs> Thanks. One of the things that YokiWorks has taken, of course, is something that's not just for her, but we wanted it to be for a lot more people. Devices for disabled people, of course, is not something that you can mass produce. It's sort of a good thing and a bad thing. So, you know, we were hoping that through this work, we can even find hundreds, maybe just thousands of people who would use the same technology, and then we could work with them to get, you know, just enablement of these lives. So, just to close, um, I wanted to sort of really highlight this idea of machine learning and human learning intersection. And I'm really excited to keep working this intersection in both consumer product as well as for individuals. Thank you. So now I'm, I'm happy to uh, introduce Gabriella Levine. Uh, she's on the Rapid Eval team at Google X, and she travels all over the world, and we'll hear all about that. Thank you. Um, I'm Gabriella Levine. As introduced, I work on the Rapid Eval team, part of Google X. 
What the Rapid Eval team is tasked with doing is coming up with new moonshot projects. So this means crazy, out-of-the-box technological solutions to projects that potentially could solve some of the world's largest problems that affect billions of people. What we value is to work hands-on, to build things, to dive right in, and to work with tools that we can feel. But we embrace failure, and we like to fail fast. Today, I want to tell you a little bit about the type of work that I do and what got me here on the Rapid Eval team. I've always been really passionate about working outside in nature and dealing with things that were harsh conditions. So this led me to spend a few seasons as a wildland firefighter based in Oregon. I was on a hotshot crew, which meant that we would travel all over the US to America's largest fires. So we would be in the middle of the forest, no access to roads, food, far from anything. It was super mentally challenging and physically demanding, but it was one of the most exciting jobs I ever had. But I was around lots of big machines that tried to fight the fires, and often it was efficient. But sometimes it was really um, not the best way to use these big machines that cost a lot of money, took a lot of manpower. So sometimes it was even just to show nearby towns that there was a lot of airspace happening, even when a fire was too big to get near. It was often really the ground crews that made a lot of difference. So it really got me thinking about automated machines and robots, and especially those that dealt with the environment. From there, I really just started prototyping and wanted to build my own robots that could go into the environment and potentially solve some natural disaster issues. So I ended up building a lot of bio-inspired robots and a lot of snake robot prototypes, which are called SNEEL. That's a story for a different day. But this led me to keep building and learn as I went and eventually co-create a startup called Prote, dealing with a robot that could go into the environment and mitigate natural disasters. This startup led me to another radical experiment. It was called Unreasonable at Sea. I was one of 10 tech startups last year on a four and a half, mi a four and a half month journey around the world by ship. So this was my home. I was one of about 30 social entrepreneurs on the ship, but it was a partnership with Semester at Sea. So it was all of us part of this accelerator program with business mentors and about 600 university students. It was weird, but it was really amazing. So we traveled together from San Diego down to Mexico, across the Pacific Ocean, around Asia, India, and then all around Africa up to Barcelona. Together, we were working with each other, um, the businesses and the students, working with the mentors, working with people at local communities in the ports, just innovating together, brainstorming, and we were deploying our robots. So the startup that I helped start and grow is called Prote. Prote is an open source, shape-shifting sailing robot meant to explore and preserve the ocean. So eventually, it's going to be unmanned, fully sustainable, as well as autonomous. But it moves like a snake through the water, and the purpose is so that it could carry long and heavy material behind it, like sensors or payload for cleaning up the ocean, like this oil-absorbent polypropylene tail. But the biomorphic body actually moves like a snake and curves in the wind, presumably increasing efficiency during the tack. So the idea is that with this flexible body, it could increase efficiency, have lower drag, and decrease the reduction of energy as it moves through the water. But Prote is a fully open source hardware project, which means that we document the designs really to enable local communities to take a hands-on approach to whatever environmental disaster they're trying to look at with an autonomous surface vessel. So you could take out the central electronics, and right now it's just a, a remote control talking to an Arduino on board that changes the shape of the boat as well as the trim of the sail. 
but you could put a Linux computer on or even an Android. You could put any sensor you want on the boat to measure any type of uh, data that you want on the water or exchange the radio for something like an iridium satellite in order to, an antenna, to presumably have this vision of multiple boats swarming around the world anywhere, and then you could be at home controlling the boat from the comfort of your own home, much like on a video game interface. Perte is being developed to solve some of the biggest natural disasters. For example, the oil spill, it was inspired by the BP oil spill in 2010, and something like this might enable all the fishermen who ended up helping and getting skin diseases and lung diseases to be taken out of the picture so robots could end up doing that. It's also being developed to map plastic trash in the middle of the ocean by having an optical camera on the front of the boat that water streams through so it can measure the particles and the microplastic size on the surface of the water. And it's being developed to map radioactivity on the coast as well as in the water. For example, near Fukushima after the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear meltdown. So wherever we went on Unreasonable at Sea, we worked with local communities seeing what their needs might be to have an autonomous boat. And we deployed the boat and we really tried to understand the needs and the people as well as how the boat would work in different types of environments. When we got to Ghana, we learned that oil had just been discovered eight years ago. Now there were oil rigs all along the, the coast, as well as the fishermen would go and fish right along the oil. We wanted to see how could prote be used to understand the relationship between the fishermen, the fish, and the oil. Now at night, the fish would gather around the, the oil rigs, which had bright lights, which was something that never used to happen. Instead of just going and interviewing and talking to some people, we met some friends. We head directly to the beach and got on a fishing boat. We rowed out with them and ended up fishing with them. I was really sick this day and actually throwing up over the side of the boat as I paddled, but it really didn't matter. It was amazing, and I just kept paddling as hard as I could. When we got to Hawaii, we learned that every island has its own rainbow beach modeled with plastic trash that comes in from the ocean. We worked with some of the scientists there to see how prote might be used to map plastic trash in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Now we're continuing efforts with these scientists to see what prote might be able to do all over the world. And finally, prote is engaging with a project working with the disaster that happened in 2011, the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear meltdown after the earthquake. This is one of the biggest disasters of the century, and it's gonna affect people for centuries to come. We wanted to see if Prote could help map the radioactivity off the coast of Fukushima, as well as in the water, something that I never had seen data about before. There's an organization called SafeCast, based in Tokyo, and they handed out open source Geiger counters in 2011. This allowed people to collect data all over the country, and they crowdsourced mapped the entire country based on radioactivity levels. We wanted to see, could Prote do this, but for the water? And all we needed was a boat to put one of the Geiger counters on. So this gave us nine days to build a boat between Hawaii and Japan, which was very early on in the, in the journey. So imagine building on a boat. It's not very easy. We were on the second level deck, way below the waterline, and it was like trying to solder on Space Mountain roller coaster as it uh, <laughs> pendulums back and forth. Plus, we ended up hitting one of the worst storms that the seasoned British captain said he's ever seen. At one point, he got on the loudspeaker and he said, everybody, get to your rooms. Things are looking grim. <laughs> so we didn't care. As I was like, soldering the PCBs for Geiger counters, uh, student interns were epoxying the outside of the boats. And we kept working, even as wood was flying everywhere as the boat shook, and electronics and epoxy. But we had to finish the boat by the time we got to Japan. 
So after countless nights of not sleeping, we finally were finishing as we pulled into port that morning. And this was a huge relief. This was one of the most beautiful sunrises I had ever seen as the seas finally calmed. So we head directly to SafeCast's headquarters. We modified the Geiger counters so that we could put them in the water as well as get data from under the water. And we head off in a car with some of the SafeCast team, drove through the night to Fukushima from Tokyo. In the morning, we finally arrived and it was like a post-apocalyptic scene. It was totally destroyed and the landscape was desolate. It was a ghost town. But we drove as close as we could to the last possible bar barrier that had been opened up. We were five miles from the nuclear plant. We put the boat in the water with the sensors and we didn't know if we'd get any data. But it was really exciting. As we lowered the sensors down to the mineral layer of the ocean floor, we were actually able to see trace amounts of radioactivity. So this was really exciting, and Protase continued collaboration with SafeCast and aims to go back in October to continue to map radioactivity there and all over the world in the ocean. So sometimes when I've been faced with crazy uh, problems, real world problems, natural disasters, I've been forced to think of crazy solutions and try them out right there on the spot. Sometimes they've been total failures, but regardless, I've learned a lot from it. So just by trying, just by diving in and not being afraid to fail, that sometimes led to crazy wild ideas that, like, like weird snake boats that might potentially solve some of the world's biggest challenges. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So now I'm going to introduce somebody else who works on Google X and some crazy robots that deal with harsh environmental terrain, this time on Mars. Hi. My name is Jamie Wado. Um, I am a systems engineer at Google X, where we work on self-driving cars. Um, but I want to talk to you today about uh, not an Earth self-driving car, but a self-driving car on Mars. Um, let's start with me in eighth grade. And I can't believe I'm showing you this picture. <laughs> this is over-permed hair that was very fashionable at the time, I promise you. Um, I have decided in my life at this point that I'm going to be a professional musician. And then I go to a science class, and um, my science teacher is talking to us about Mars and um, space, and he's telling us about uh, the NASA missions like Viking that happened in the 70s where two Viking landers actually landed on the surface of Mars and collected data and maybe, maybe not found evidence of life. And I'm like, gosh, that's amazing. I'm doing that. Now, at the time, NASA is not going to Mars. There are no Mars missions on the books. We haven't been to Mars since the 70s. I'm not that old. Um, and so we uh, now need um, a way to get there. But that's my dream. That's what I'm doing. By the time I get to high school, I realize that to go to Mars and to go to NASA, what I really need to do is work at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, or JPL as we call it. Um, and I need to probably be a mechanical engineer. So that's what I decide to do. I go to college in mechanical engineering, and I um, end up waiting tables at Perkins Family Restaurant and Bakery, which is like a Denny's maybe. Um, and I am waiting tables, and a guy comes in, and it uh, turns out he's just retired from JPL. And he has just moved to Bozeman, Montana, where I'm working and going to school. And um, he says, come over to my house, and we'll talk about it. So, of course, I go to a stranger's house in the middle of nowhere because that seems like a good idea. And uh, I get an interview a week later. I have an internship a week after that. 
uh, which is pretty amazing. And so these are the early years at JPL for me. Uh, the early years were really focused on testing and proving out the landing systems to get two twin rovers, Curiosity, or, uh, sorry, Spirit and Opportunity, safely to the surface of Mars. And I ran um, a huge test program. Uh, and these are the guys that worked for me. You can see me. At the time, I had red hair um, in the back, and then all of the guys helping me uh, pull off all of those tests. Um, and by the early 2000s, I had been assigned to uh, work on my first child. Um, and this is her. Her name is Curiosity. Uh, she was slated to go to Mars in 2007. Turns out we launched in 2009. Um, but I'm in charge of all things mobility. And so what does that mean? That means, yeah. <laughs> Differential, the suspension, the wheels, everything on your car that makes your car go, the same things are on a rover that make a rover go. They're also the same things on a self-driving car. Um, and so it all kind of ties together, right? I'm working on this. Uh, one of the things we work on is the wheel. And uh, that was my team, me and a bunch of guys who worked for me. Uh, and so the wheel is really special. Um, you, when you go to Mars, it gets down to 135 below uh, centigrade and it gets up to 70 centigrade, and so you can't go with traditional materials. So the wheel's actually made out of an aluminum rim, um, and that, that wall thickness of that skin of that tire is 30 thousandths thick. Uh, to put that in perspective, that's the thickness of three sheets of paper, and that's what makes that wheel uh, round and hold. Um, people continually ask me, why did you make it so thin, especially right now with the story I'm about to tell you, and uh, the reason is, there are six wheels on, on the vehicle, and so every ounce of material you put on there is, is um, multiplied by six. And so we're constantly, one of our key constraints is that we have to make it lightweight. Another one is that we have to be able to climb large rocks. This is a mobile platform that wants to climb up a mountain. Uh, and another thing is that we have to really cushion the way the vehicle uh, drives. So you can see these spoked wheels in here. Uh, it's six titanium flexures kind of like a spoked bicycle wheel, but now in three dimensions. And that's the design we propose. And we start testing it. Now, you may know Curiosity is pretty special. It's a brand new landing system for NASA. So we actually have a jet pack that flies her close to the surface of Mars. And then she drops down from the jet pack and lands on her wheels, which sounds so easy. And in all of the videos that they show about it, it's super benign. But imagine you don't get to pick your landing spot. So there can be slopes and there can be rocks. So we actually test that. And we started out with some of our early prototypes. And this is high speed video. I promise we're not moving that slow. Um, and so that wheel is coming down, and we're testing to see what happens when you land on major rocks. We want to make sure we're designing a wheel that works. And so the wheel's going to come down, and it's going to hit this rock. And you'll watch the rock puncture through the skin of the tire and totally deform it. But then it almost all bounces back. And all you've got are these little cracks in the wheel. And then we tested that, and we drove it over a whole bunch of terrain to make sure that those cracks don't do what we call propagate or spread out. And we made sure it was good to go. And so we tested all of that. We also took her out into what we call the Mars Yard at JPL, um, where we simulate the Martian terrain. Um, and if you know a thing or two about mobility systems for Mars, you know that you really want to design a mobility system that can climb one wheel diameter. But for me and my team, that wasn't sufficient. So we got extra credit, and we can climb two wheel diameters. We don't ever let her do that on Mars, I promise. But she can do it. Um, this is her early prototype, just so uh, you get a little bit of a story here. Uh, her name is Scarecrow. Um, and we call her Scarecrow because she doesn't have a brain. <laughs> it's just a little button box we drive her with. Um, we also tested, so those were tall rocks, now we're testing wide rocks. And one of the things we found when we drove over wide rocks is this phenomena where the vehicle actually gets one wheel on one side of the rock, one wheel on the other side of the rock, and then starts lifting those rocks up off of the ground. And those really do damage to the wheels. And so we thought, well, gosh, what are we going to do? We're getting close to launch. This is a bad idea. Uh, we need to uh, fix this. And so I said, I know. We'll just tell the drivers, don't drive over wide rocks. So that's what we did. Um, and they don't drive over wide rocks. They're doing a great job. Um, 
We also test her inside the clean room. And so this is me and my friend Peter. Um, and we're making sure that, that when we tell the wheels to go forward, the rover goes forward. And we tell her to go backwards, she goes backwards. And when we tell her to steer, she steers the right way. So a very basic test to really build the confidence that we've built the right vehicle. And then the extreme tests we do on Scarecrow to make sure that uh, we've done everything right. Then we launch her. This is out of Cape Canaveral. Um, and we say goodbye. And gosh, this is really like postpartum depression for a rover mama. And so our baby's gone. Yeah, um, which is an exciting day. It's like you've sent her off to college, but she's never coming back. <laughs> she gets to Mars, and she takes a selfie, says, hi, I'm here. She really does. That, that's her taking that. Um, we don't fake that, I promise. And so everything looks good, right? And, and I go on my merry way. I go off to Google X, and uh, all of a sudden, the phone rings. And they say, Jamie, have you seen what we're driving on? And I look, and this is the picture I have. And the rocks are like nothing we've ever seen on Mars. We've landed on Mars at NASA quite a bit. Um, and we're, in fact, uh, fairly good at landing on Mars. We have never seen rocks that look like this. They're basically knife-edged pyramids. And we're driving over a lot of them. And I'm like, well, how bad is it? This is the next picture they sent me. And these are the wheels. Uh, Sol 564, so the, a Martian day is called a Sol. It's 45 minutes longer than an Earth day. Um, and so we're about a year, a little more, into the mission. We want to go for two years, um, and we've got holes all over it. And they're pretty significant, right? Um, that's not really what we designed. We did design holes in the wheels. Does anybody know what the holes say? Yeah. JPL and Morse code, that's right leaving our fingerprints all over the surface of Mars. Um, see, engineers have fun, right? <laughs> so uh, yeah, we basically have the equivalent of a Martian flat tire. And I realize that I'm in the situation where um, there's not going to be a right answer. We are completely over constrained. And so I say, well, the first thing I would do is I would drive backwards. And they're like, what? And I said, well, what we did is we designed Curiosity so that whatever trouble she gets into going forward, she's actually better at driving in reverse. So turn her around. She's a robot. She doesn't care. Turn the camera around, and you're good to go. Just drive backwards. You're at least doing damage to different wheels. And so they do that. They don't really like it because they don't have as good a view of the cameras, but she's doing great. Then I tell them, can we not drive on those rocks? <laughs> so we start driving on um, sandier soils. But sanding soil isn't, isn't fun either. Um, curiosity is like a little kid in a sandbox. She gets in, and she can start throwing up sand all over herself. That gets on the science instruments and the cameras. And um, she can actually bury herself. The reason we actually put JPL in the wheels is, is well, we wanted to put our fingerprints on Mars. Um, but it's also because we know how big the wheel is. And we know how far apart those, those asymmetric tread patterns should be in the surface. And so we can measure the distance in our cameras. We know how far apart they should be. We know how par far apart they are. And that difference is how much she's slipping, so that we make sure she's not burying herself in, like Spirit did. So we do that, but it's slow going. Um, and you can see here, it, it's a lot of slipping and a lot of um, dust being thrown up everywhere. So again, the scientists aren't, aren't super happy that, that we have to do this, but it's better than tearing up those wheels. Another thing we do is um, we take a lot more pictures. She's not taking selfies up here anymore. She's taking selfies of her shoes and making sure that we're tracking the damage that's happening to those wheels. Uh, we have two twins now. You see Scarecrow. There's another twin. I, I'm not really sure what her name is. Um, it was VSTB for Vehicle System Test Bed. We're not always fun when we're engineers. Um, but this is the Mars Yard again. And what we do now is we've got orbiters that fly over Mars. They take high-resolution pictures of the surface of Mars. And then from that, we mock up with interns carrying rocks all around what those what that terrain is going to look like. We test it on Earth, and we make sure it's OK, and then we can go on Mars. You can see that's a huge amount of work, a ton of logistics, and very time consuming. But we do it to make sure that she's doing what she's supposed to. Another thing we do, we just don't 
drive as much. So we sit here. This is a place called the Kimberley because apparently it looks like the Kimberley in Australia. Um, and she's sitting there right now, actually, uh, drilling and doing a lot of really great science. Uh, but it's a compromise. Everything is a compromise. The uh, scientists want to be at the top of that mountain. And we're just probably not going to get there. Um, and, and that's really unfortunate when you're a mobility engineer and you've designed this thing to give the scientists all of their dreams come true. Um, but what I've realized through this is that uh, the thing that I'm most passionate about in engineering is being on those problems, the problems that are completely over-constrained, the ones where there's not a right answer because everything is just wrong. And you get to be in the center of that, and you get to figure out how to solve those compromises, which constraints are wrong, push back, which ones are really important and you have to listen to, and how do you tune that answer to really optimize across no good answer, and that's the part that I just totally love, because you get to be creative and you get to really put your fingerprints on the design. And so this is us leaving our fingerprints on the surface. And I encourage you, when you're in those moments, to realize that that answer is going to be uniquely yours because it's you and no one else solving it. Thank you. I, get to, I have to tell you a little story. Um, when I was getting ready to go to Google X, I Googled Google X. Uh, to try to figure out what it was, because it was pretty top secret. And I came across a video um, with our next speaker, Megan Smith. And I was blown away. And I told my husband, I'm like, I cannot wait to meet this woman. And every day, I come home from work at Google X, and he's like, have you met Megan Smith yet? And I'm like, no. And he calls her my work crush. <laughs> I haven't told her that until right now. Um, <laughs> And so I am very excited. It is on my bucket list of things to do. I get to introduce the Megan Smith. Hello. That was incredible. Um, it's clear to me that hardware is definitely the new black. You know, we wanted to focus on robotics because uh, for this Women Tech Maker session, the second one that we've had in our new tradition at I.O., um, because there's just extraordinary things happening in robotics right now. It's really entering the mainstream in so many ways, in so many parts of our lives. And there's really extraordinary women who are part of those teams. And so we wanted to bring it, like we do with women tech makers. We want to talk about uh, and show you extraordinary women. Um, also, the other thing about robotics is that for whatever reason, because of media bias or other things, when we think of robotics and who is making them, we do think about boys and men. And so that kind of brings me to women tech makers. And I just wanted to say a little bit um, about, uh, about women tech makers and this idea of debugging inclusion. So uh, this is a photo from 2012. And what we thought of at that time, Google I.O. was only in the single digits of percentages of women. Uh, I think there were about 300 women in Google I.O. Of, of 2012. And so we decided that the night before, we would have a gathering so people would have some friends in the hallway and not feel like such a minority. And so this is a, an image from then. And I just wanted to show you an image uh, from whatever, two, two nights ago or last night. The, one of the many dinners we had, um, we have more than 1,000 women here at I.O., and we had 800 women out to dinner uh, in the gathering. Uh, very exciting. The other thing that happened in 2012 was, you know, one of the things that's true about diversity at work, none of us created any of the biases that are happening to us. We inherited the world that we live in. And so it's, it's not that um, we should feel guilty about them. What we should do is, as we wake up and see them, you know, many of them are very unconscious. Uh, as we wake up and see them, we should do things about them. And so one of the things we thought in 2012, since we really noticed just how invisible uh, the women, the technical women are. And so um, one of the things we started to do with women tech makers is we began to make a video series. And so we, were, we, we had videos from Mexico, from London, from uh, Silicon Valley, from New York, all around the world of just interviewing technical women and get them in front of you. Um, we also started to do things around Google I.O. again. So for 2013, we really worked hard to make sure we put extraordinary women onto the main stage at the keynote. This is Johanna. Um, and then we had our first women tech makers session, which was called Seven Tech Makers in a Microphone. 
And one of my favorite uh, talks at that was Kathy Kleiman. I don't know if people were there. But she talked about a 70-year-old lost history story of the first programmers in America, six women who, during World War II, were Rosie the mathematician. And they, they were handed the wiring diagrams of the ENIAC. And they had been calculating ballistic trajectories, which is a differential equation that took um, a good, um, a good you know, week long to do. And they said, could you do this? Because it'd be a great demo. And they went in and wrote the first sort routines and made those happen. That movie has now been made that Kathy introduced that was going to be there. And it's, gonna, it's already on the film festival tour. And we're going to start to do some film festivals. We're doing one at Hopper with the Maker series, which is great. Um, the next thing that happened was Natalie joined, and she started to really drive us to do things. And this is uh, an idea that we had for International Women's Day. Um, during that month of March, everybody's celebrating women, and we thought we could engage the Google developer groups. And many of the leaders are here in the room, so thank you. Uh, so this is the team in Nigeria. And in fact, this is the map that shows you over 11,000 technical women met around the world during the month of March, met each other, began to build community, began to know about resources, and began to drive visibility. And so we had, I think, 52 uh, different countries and uh, over 125 events. So thank you to the, the GDGs and folks who made this happen. It's so important. So this is the, the, the uh, this is what we saw. And now we're also starting to expand on resources. And one of the things that happened this year was many of these partners on screen, Girl Develop It, Women Who Code, and others, uh, Hack Bright Academy, helped us find a lot of the women that are here, the women who we should have been inviting. And so we worked with many of them. And then I also wanted to let you know that we've partnered with Code School. Uh, so the women tech makers are going to be offering uh, three months of uh, free access uh, for women who want to come in and uh, hone skills, intermediate and beginner level. So I guess my ask to all of you is, as women tech makers, now we've got a platform. So let's keep pushing. Let's all work on this visibility. Let's all work on building community. I think that what's cool and amazing about the tech industry is we're really mission-driven people. And we really believe um, that we can make the changes. We work on all these extraordinary products. And so even though, like all the other industries, we have these issues with bias and with trouble and with things that have gone before, we are one of the most innovative groups on the planet. And so I think we actually have the possibility to move the fastest to change all of this and to really include the people that we need in the innovation in this world. So thank you for being here and for hearing these incredible women and for all of the work that everybody does. It's definitely only going to work if we have parallel processing everywhere, parallel innovation. One of the things I love about the fact that our L team, uh, Larry's team, and the, the executives at Google set a goal for us to be, um, could we be the best company for women and underrepresented minorities? Could we figure out how to do that? Yeah. And, and you see us doing this innovative work, um, really piloting things, trying things. Some of them will work, some won't. We released our numbers to try to get our mind around the challenges. Uh, but really, what it really did by setting that goal to me was it opened up the innovation space to all of us to wonder, what does that mean? How would I measure that? How can I actually make an impact? And so that's what we're all up to. And we hope you'll join us and set that goal for our whole industry. So thank you for being here. And I think we're going to go to Q&A, right? OK, so come on up. So all, all of our speakers are going to come up. And also Natalie Villalobos, who runs Women Tech Makers and been driving this. And Devrel, together with Stephanie Liu, who's here, and some of the other folks. So I think we have like five minutes for some couple questions. Yeah, about five minutes. Um, I actually have a question to Jamie. So why do you call it a her? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I forgot to tell you that. So um, everybody at JPL calls our rovers by the female pronouns she and her. Uh, some will tell you that it's after the Navy tradition where they name their ships after females because they're difficult to control. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's actually because they're amazing, beautiful creations, and, and we should celebrate that. So that's why I call yeah. them. But yeah, so we, we have some mics up at the front. We already have one nice gentleman here. Uh, what's your question? Hi. Um, it's not as much a question, but um, I'm from Toronto, Canada. 
And uh, my wife actually runs two organizations called Ladies Learning Code and Kids Learning Code. I don't know if you've had a chance to take a look at them. Um, but if you haven't, I strongly recommend you take a look. It's exactly what you guys are doing, and I'm sure they'd love to, to participate in whatever you do. Uh, she is back in Toronto, unfortunately. She's uh, running some workshops and preparing for the entire oh. summer of camp and whatnot. Nice. So um, ladies, say it ladies again. Ladies learning code. Ladies and, learning code. And kids learning code. And kids learning code. Uh, girls it, learning code as girls, well, sorry. Okay, and girls learning code. Girls so code. we will add those into, we have the Women Tech Maker site, which Natalie's got all kinds of resources. Every time you want to tell us about stuff, we'll add them there. And also last week we launched the Made With Code yep. High School Girl Outreach uh, Program, which is the things you love are made with code. For whatever reason, they don't know that, and we need to tell them, so we'll add the girls-related stuff We saw there. that, and thought it was really amazing. She's thank really you. excited to use some of that stuff. And uh, thanks, yeah. Yeah, no, thanks for thanks sharing for being that. Here. Yes. This question is for Gabriella. When she was taking the measurements for the Fukushima disaster uh, along the coast and uh, measuring its impact in the coastal uh, Pacific, um, what uh, was the outcome, or what is the conclusion to that? Um, is that s something that we could, at this moment, be fearful of the all the the fish? Is it jeopardize our, um, you know, our our food chain, seafood chain? So that was my question as well. What, what, why, yeah, what's going on underwater? Because people are eating the seafood, people are fishing, and it's being distributed. We just got a very little amount of data, and it was with a very rough sensor. So we're trying to continue that effort, and Prote's trying to, to get more partners to get more data faster. At the moment, um, yeah, there's not all that much data about it, but uh, there are other resources to look at that I could also talk to you about after. We, we ran a, a session, Solve for X, solvex.com session, which is one of the passion projects at Google X, and there's a guy, Lou, who's here, who's doing really interesting crowdsource measure monitoring across China. Um, the Alibaba team actually went home from vacation doing crowdsource, their, it's called Danger Map, look for that video. But this idea that Gabriella and others are onto, and your point, which actually drew from your insight from firefighting that sometimes the big meta stuff isn't as good as small pieces on the ground and lots of data. And so using robots in this form is, is what she's advocating, I think. And, and we need to get out as developers and, and innovate more of that and do more measurement ex so that we can exactly have the answers, not only for this Chinese project in China or projects around the world, um, and to engage youth into them, but also specifically for our oceans. Well, living in the Bay Area, you know, this is a real major concern because already there's some areas that, that, you know, they have signs posted, do not fish here. Right. And that's kind of uh, in the back of my mind. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, uh, my name is Daphne LaRose, and hearing all of your stories was, as a fellow engineer, it's like really inspiring and wonderful. Um, and as someone who has made it my own mission to um, bring visibility not just to women in tech, but women of color in tech, I think it's just awesome to hear about what you guys have done. Um, one of the, th the questions I've often had for myself and that I hear a lot from um, other engineers is, how do you find your niche? So each of you kind of have like a, an area that you just seem to fall into, but like how did you discover that and where did you really discover your passion? Uh, I'll tell you how I <laughs> discovered my passion. Um, I had it uh, at JPL. I was sending stuff to Mars and I was super stoked about it. And when you're doing things that you're passionate about, you rock at it and that's pretty fun. Um, then I left and I went into medical for a while and hated it, lost my passion, couldn't figure out what it was. And it was actually through Natalie calling me to do this talk that I figured out what I love again. And it's solving Woo. those gnarly, crazy problems. <laughs> so thank you to Women yeah. Tech because you made me find my passion again. So cool. Other passion, yeah. yeah. Other passion stories, passion? I, I think uh, mine's a little similar. Um, it was or some similar aspects. I found a community 
that I really loved to work with and the tools that I really loved working with. From there, it came easy, but I did have a very diverse background and a wide range of things that I had done, both very technical as well as creative. So it was trying a lot of things, really never saying no, and then getting excited about the tools and the people that I worked with. And I was lucky to find that because I got very focused, and, but also very unfocused, answering big questions. And so um, a combination of all of that. Awesome. Yeah, yeah um, I think um, I, I would say my, my passion has been always around having impact, and that's what made me go into technology because I felt it was creative venue to be and also have a huge impact on the world. So that's been kind of my order to go where I go. Um, I'll make it short, but you know, for me, it's don't think too hard. <laughs> it's a big one. So to just, As engineers, well, that's all we do is think too hard. <laughs> yeah, I think it's really a key. Just don't think too hard and just get into something that you love. You and then answer. that might lead you to the next passion. And you don't worry about your life story. It's totally okay to have multiple chapters. You know, I think that's really what I think. So, so I, I, you have to answer. I also, I'm going to, um, I don't know if Pavni said her name when she got up, but this is Pavni Dewanji. She's a VP of engineering at Google. I just want to make sure everyone knew that. She's amazing. She's amazing. She has so many different um, things. And then in terms of me finding my passion, I think that, so I actually know Pavni because we built Google Plus together. Um, obviously, I'm not, a, I'm not a VP, but I really looked up to her when I was uh, first starting on Google Plus as a community manager. And I think for me, I started noticing that I loved nourishing large groups of people. I loved hearing stories and, and helping people and assisting them with like particular asks, but it was really about kind of a solving for a larger group. And so I think for me, I, I started to see an opportunity of how can I actually help uh, foster a social movement? And with everything that's going on in our industry, I think I just needed to add more fuel to that, and, and I wanted to dedicate my life to that. I got to take uh, acoustics from Professor Bose, like Bose speakers, and he used to tell us, you guys are high performers, you have to find your passion. If you find your passion, you can be unstoppable. He says the number one thing you need to do. And so I think it's a really important question for people to ask themselves. And I think also um, for women to like also be, pre like get out and speak and talk about your passions, because you have amazing things to talk about too. Uh, for myself, I was lucky because I um, got to do science fair as a kid, and I, I like, when I, I work on a million different things, I'm very ADD, so I, uh, but I, they tend to have a theme. One is I really like to work on things that help people uh, with their lives, and I especially, and, and I like to work on things that reduce our impact on the planet, and almost everything kind of themes around that inclusion, those kinds of themes, and I, I think I also tend to not be the founder, I've done that before, but I tend to have a really good eye for people who have great ideas, especially in the early, earliest stages, and figure out how to help them. Reid Hoffman calls it the smart generalists who work with the founders. So I tend to come up underneath people and help them. And I think that in Silicon Valley, we always focus on the founder, when really Regina Dugan, who was, I think, in this room earlier today, who ran DARPA, she said, uh, there's a new thing that the basketball teams are doing is studying hustle. So who's on the court? with Michael Jordan when he's really performing. Mm. And so there's people around who can do that stuff, and I like to do that kind of work. And I think that those are very valid jobs, and they really move stuff forward, because people have extraordinary ideas. If you can amplify them, major things can happen. And to add to that, and then actually we're going to have to end Q&A, but we'll be over here and available to answer more questions. Um, so Megan actually taught me a really important thing, which was the term yes and. I never took improv theater classes when I was younger. Um, and so surround yourself with people that say yes and to you, more than yes but. Yeah. Thank you so much Thanks. for joining Thank us. Thank you. Thanks.